what I thought was as a part, I will focus on the solar economy, okay, a vision how the solar will evolve. But, uh, but the whole talk of solar is quite vague. So I decided to focus on one topic, which is the fuels from solar. And as you will see, that's a running picture through the, through the, for the entire 30, 35 minutes of my talk, which is what you'll be hearing. So when, when I think of solar economy, basically, if you look at the world today, everything we do comes from fossil fuel, right? So fossil fuel makes fertilizers, they make, uh, make fuels for the car, for the airplanes, they light produce the electricity. So everything is driven by, driven by, by the fossils, okay? So the, my goal here is to talk to you like where we use everything from solar photons, energy, for everything, for making chemicals, fertilizers for food, making electricity, making fuels for the transportation, and heat and purifying water, everything which you can think of. Okay, so that's the goal. Okay. So how will that be? Like, so as you envision the future, like you know, what you can clearly see is as the solar photons come along. Obviously, we grow food, we grow plants, and wheat, and corn, and and soybean, and so forth, and so forth. But we're using also solar photons to produce electricity, and uh, and from the electricity, and also we will produce hydrogen. Okay, by direct photosynthesis or by using electricity to to electrolyze water and produce hydrogen and so forth and purification of the seawater, maybe make pure water. And we will use all those things to make products, right? So we will have the local small scale plants. So one of the big changes which is going to happen in future is right now what happens is you have fossil fuels like NAFTA or crude, it comes to one big refinery. And refineries of the size of something like 350,000 barrels a day to 500,000 barrels a day. So we're all used to the chemical plants, which are quite humongous, quite big. But but what's going to happen in the in the solar economy that all this will not be possible? Okay, we will be building the plants on a small scale, very close to where the solar where the where we'll be harnessing the solar energy, and so we'll produce hydrogen, we'll produce electricity. We'll have carbon from the biomass, and we'll use that to make chemicals. Okay, we will make fertilizers, and so we will supply the electricity to the to the adjoining urban areas actually, and they will use hydrogen fuel cell cars. They will use electric cars, okay, and so forth and so forth. So there'll be an interdependency, and you'll have some solar panels on the rooftop. You'll have some solar panels on the adjoining fields, and some some solar panels even on the agriculture farmland. So that's everything will be very interdependent and uh, it will be more of a distributed scale rather than a one big humongous scale. So we'll see a big difference, okay? And, and since I'm gonna be focusing on the fuels, I just wanted to let you know when I'm talking about fuels, I'm talking about electricity, hydrogen, and the hydrocarbons, okay? All three kinds of fuels. As you can see here, the hydrogen fuel cell cars, for example, will be there. Hydrogen could be there to store the energy and then there could be electric fuel cars, okay? and um, and there will still be hydrocarbons needed for, for, for to go long distances, such as airplanes and so forth. So, so, so we will use all three forms of, uh, of, uh, of uh, fuel in, in the sense, and I will try to, to see how we go from here. Okay. All right. So with that, let's go to the next slide. Okay. Here, what you find is that we got the electricity from wind and solar energy and so forth. Okay. And there are other elements of nature like water, CO2, soil, and so forth. So the challenge for us is gonna be like, as we move forward is to how to harness all this energy and transform it into let's say biomass, hydrogen, electricity, and heat, okay? And then use these elements like the biomass, carbon from biomass, for example, and the hydrogen, which will be directly produced or could be produced using electricity through electrolyzers and electricity and heat. And how do we use that to make fertilizers? Okay, like for example, if you want to make urea, you could make ammonia, for example, using nitrogen from air, and hydrogen from air, from the solar energy. And then you can combine hydrogen and nitrogen to make ammonia and then ammonia nitrate and then carbon dioxide from biomass and you can make urea and so forth. You can make all the chemicals from the carbons from biomass. You can provide the residential needs like you know, all the electricity, all the cooking and so forth. You can produce a fresh water, you can purify water. Energy storage will be there and the batteries, hydrogen, storage, chemical storage, ammonia as a storage, methanol as a storage, and so forth. And of course, for transportation, we'll have the internal combustion engines still, we'll have plug-in hybrids, we'll have hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, and heat, of course, from any of these things, we can produce heat. 
So that's the vision actually. So we can build the whole economy just as we have built the economy on fossil fuels like NAFTA, natural gas, coal. Similarly, we can build an entire economy based on, uh, on the renewable energy. Okay? And by renewable energy, I mean solar and, and the wind. But, uh, so let's, uh, let's look at uh, one by one the fuels. So first, let, let us look at the hydrocarbon fuel because that's what we are most familiar with. So we are going to go ahead and look at the biomass. And when you look at the fuels from biomass, okay, so, so as you, you all probably know that there are many ways of taking a biomass, okay, which comes from obviously air and water and so forth, okay, so we can take the, we can take the biomass and convert it to, to fuel by using any of the processes. So you guys are familiar with the fermentation, for example, you can take corn and you can ferment it, make alcohol, okay, or you can use a fish across process where you gasify the biomass. And then you gas gasify the biomass, you get what carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And once you have carbon monoxide and hydrogen, they can react to make any fuel you want. You can make diesel, you can make the gasoline and whatever have you. And you can do an isothermal, hydrothermal gasification, or you can do spiralizing. And what is spiralizing? Basically taking a biomass and heating it to high temperature, like 500 to 600 degrees Celsius. And all the biomass molecules fragment into smaller molecules, which are liquid-like and the gaseous molecules we can use as fuel. So these are the processes which have been very well studied and there are a lot of them around, okay, and they can produce fuel. But one, one feature, a common feature of all these processes is that when you take the biomass, like uh, what you find out that the carbon content of these biomass, like let's say 100 carbon atoms which come with biomass, only 60, 50 to 60 carbon atoms show up as fuel and, uh, and something like uh, 40 to 60, 50 carbon atoms show up as uh, as the what I call as 40 to 60 carbon atoms show sorry 50 to 60 carbon atoms show up as uh, sorry 30 to 40 40 to 50 carbon atoms show up as as carbon dioxide. So when you're doing a conversion process, the recovery of the carbon is only 60 percent. Okay, so you're losing 40 percent carbon, which is coming with the biomass as carbon dioxide. And why that is important, we will discuss that in a minute. For the time being, what this tells us that for every carbon atoms we get here, we only make up 60 carbon atoms as fuel. So we are not recovering all the carbon atoms in the biomass as liquid fuel. Okay, we lose a pretty large portion of the biomass carbon as carbon dioxide. Okay. All right. So with that, like uh, if you wanted to increase the liquid fuel yield from biomass, so let us say if you have X quantity of biomass and uh, you make by quantity of liquid fuel, but that's not enough. You wanted more liquid fuel, then how would you how do you go about doing that? Okay. So so the first question is hey, okay, all right. So if I want more liquid fuel, I should increase my carbon recovery. Okay, because my carbon recovery right now is low, right? Because I told you that we only recover roughly 60% of the biomass carbon as fuel and 40% is not recovered. So so the question is why is the carbon recovery low? The reason the carbon recovery is low is because if you look at a biomass, right? So what is biomass composed of? Biomass is composed of hemicellulose, cellulose, and, and, uh, and lignin. And if you look at all these molecules, they all have oxygen, right? So, so biomass has roughly 30, 30 weight percent, uh, percent oxygen. And since it has more oxygen, okay, we all know that if you have a hydrocarbon molecule, it's like partially oxidized, right? So energy in the hydrocarbon comes from oxidation of the hydrocarbon to carbon dioxide and water, right? So we burn hydrocarbon and that's how we get the energy. But if biomass carbon is already partially oxidized, okay, it already has 35 to 8 percent oxygen. So obviously per carbon atom, it has less energy, right? Because when we burn this, we are not going to get as much energy as we burn, for example, a gasoline molecule. Like, so if you burn a benzene or a hexane, there's no oxygen on it. So all the carbon can be oxidized and all the hydrogen can be oxidized. But here, biomass is already partially oxidized. Since it is partially oxidized, we get less energy, okay, from per carbon atom from the biomass, okay. And same thing, lignin. You can see the lignin is ha also has has very high content of oxygen, okay. All right. So what does that mean? So what that means is, if you look at a biomass, okay, per carbon atom, it has 450 kilojoules of, uh, let's say, 450 units of energy, whereas a gasoline molecule like octane, for example, per carbon atom would have 655 units of of energy. So if you take three carbon atoms of biomass, and it will have roughly the same energy as two carbon atoms of gasoline. Fair? Yeah? Because two, two carbon atoms of gasoline is roughly 1200 units of energy. 
and three units of carbon atoms will also be around 1350, like you know, around the same same units of energy. So what that means is that if I'm making if I'm taking biomass power and if I'm making gasoline type molecules, the first law of conservation of energy tells us that there is no way I can get for every carbon atom, I can get a carbon atom of gasoline, right? Because uh, it will take three carbon atoms of biomass to have the same energy as the two carbon atoms of gasoline. So if I'm converting biomass to gasoline, then obviously I can only recover two thirds at most from the first law of constraint. I can only recover two thirds of the carbon atom as gasoline. Right? I cannot. Re if anyone comes to, ever comes to you and says, "Hey, they converted biomass to gasoline and said they recovered 80% of the carbon in biomass as as gasoline," well, you have to be tell them go away, right? Because you know you cannot violate the first law. Okay, that would be a wrong thing to do. Okay. So basically, what is happening is the low energy density of my biomass limits the carbon recovery. So, so if you wanted more carbon atoms to appear as liquid fuel, you will have to supply more energy to the system. So how should you get your liquid fuels? Should you grow more biomass? Okay, but before you grow, if you wanted to grow more biomass, you will need more land. And uh, we all know that by this time that most of the land which we can grow, we are already using it to make, make food, right? So since we're already using land for food, chances of finding an extra land to grow biomass is, is, is not that high, okay? All right, so, so, let's, so what that means is, is we need another energy source, okay? We need another energy source to combine with the biomass carbon to get more liquid fuel. So at least making sure that we don't lose that one third of the carbon from biomass as CO2, okay? So let's look at, if you go to recover the, the energy from sunlight, okay, how, what are the efficiencies of recovery? So if you look at the solar photons, and if you see the different forms of energy you can recover. So let's take electricity, for example. Today you can buy and go ahead and buy a, buy a PV panel, which are 15 to 20% efficient. What does that 15 to 20% efficiency mean? Okay, let me see if I can get a pointer. Right? pointer. So what does the, the electricity efficiency of 20% would mean? That would mean is that if you take a land area of one meter square, for example, and if you put the solar panels on top of it, then what that means is that of every 100 joules of energy which is falling from the sunlight on the solar panel, okay, 20% of it will show up as electricity. Okay, so that we'll call that 20% efficient because you're recovering 20% of the solar energy as electricity and you can buy those solar panels today. Okay, all right. And if you recover all that energy as heat, not as electricity, you can recover like 60 to 70 percent of the solar energy as heat and at very high temperatures. Okay, all right. And if you're trying to make hydrogen, you obviously if you make electricity at 20 percent efficiency, you can use an electrolyzer with 50 percent efficiency and you can get 10 percent efficient hydrogen. Right. OK. Or you can make directly a hydrogen, which is like 30 percent efficient from the sunlight. But how about biomass? So if you grow the biomass and one of the even the most efficient crops, such as corn and the sugar cane and all those things. OK, if you're doing it, the efficiency is only at most is 2 percent and generally it is more like 1 percent. What does that mean? That on same one meter land square land area, if you're growing corn, for example, you know, in, in the year how much sunlight is falling on it. And then you can see how much energy is in the in the biomass carbon, that hydrocarbons, oxygen containing hydrocarbon which you're getting from biomass. And you're gonna find it that it has only 1% of the energy of the sunlight. And so we all know that if we take that biomass and convert it to liquid fuel, that process cannot be 100% efficient. We know that, right? There'll be losses of conversion. And if we assume that it's 50% efficient, then what happens is you get only 0.5% of efficiency. So if you're getting, 0.5% efficiency versus 20% efficiency, it is no brainer, right? That uh, you will end up using what? You will end up using 40 times more land area to get the same amount of energy, right? As you would get from the directly using the land for electricity. So if you want to grow biomass for energy, then use of land is very inefficient, right? Because uh, you could recover the same energy at the very high efficiency from, um, from using a photovoltaic panel or using a photosynthesis method for making hydrogen production, and, uh, but, the, but the biomass is very low fuel. So what is it telling us? It is telling us that biomass is primarily a carbon source. So if anyone comes and tells us that they're using a biomass to make heat or electricity or hydrogen, we should, we should just stop, right? Because we know that's not the proper use of uh, solar energy. Because ultimately, in solar economy, we'll be, we'll be governed by the land area which we have, 
and the land area on which the sunlight is falling. Okay, because every meter square is because solar to collect solar energy, basically we need the land area, right? Because it is all about how much sunlight is falling on a unit land unit land area. Okay, and biomass is primarily a carbon source. Okay, all right. So we know that. So if you wanted biomass, if you use as a standalone, as we just talked, okay, and the CO2 is released, okay. So, so this, this is kind of a kind of a nonsensical case in the sense that we are using like 420, 415 parts per million CO2 in that atmosphere, and we are recovering that as a biomass in our hand as a, as paper or or as things. And then what we are doing is we are turning around and releasing 40% of that back to the atmosphere. We don't want to do that, right? Because we, we got that carbon from the atmosphere with a lot of hard work, right? Because we had to wait patiently, all that land was used and so forth. Okay, so we don't want to lose that carbon. So what we should do is we should supplement the biomass conversion process with the energy from which we can recover at least 20 to 50, 40 times more efficiently than, than we can grow biomass and combine that energy. And so all that carbon dioxide, which is being released to the atmosphere will react with hydrogen, forming water, and hydrogen will react with oxygen in the carbon, carbon dioxide forming water, and carbon will react with the hydrogen forming hydrocarbons or whatever molecules they're forming. So we can recover all the carbon which is in the biomass. So the goal is you take a biomass, you make your hydrogen from, from whatever source, okay, from, uh, from the wind or from the solar, PV, photovoltaic, and put that hydrogen along with the biomass, okay, and whatever process you pick, so at Purdue in my group, we did a lot of research on fast hydrophoralysis and hydrodeoxygenation to make liquid products. And we succeeded in doing that. But uh, in general, it doesn't matter what process you use. You could use gasification. You, you could use fermentation followed by reactions. Whatever you want to use, the idea is use the hydrogen, convert all that oxygen, which is in the biomass, get it out as water, not as carbon dioxide, and get all the carbon, which is in the biomass, as a useful product. Because if you wanted to get that carbon from the from the atmosphere, right? Okay, it will be very difficult to that get, get that carbon, right? So, for example, like let's do a hypothetical experiment. In that hypothetical experiment, like we know, let's call that the that the concentration of carbon dioxide in the air today is 420 parts per million, and we all know that that's a bad for the environment, right? Because 420 parts per million CO2 is uh, is a very high concentration in terms of the CO2 warming and so forth. However, as a chemical engineer, if someone gave us a task of going and recovering carbon dioxide from the air, then, uh, then we know that's a very difficult task because if you sit down, you might do, let's do a thought experiment, right? So if we had a beaker and we had a forcep and we had a million molecules go by us, okay? And all those million molecules were of two colors, okay? All of them, let's say all the molecules were blue in color and there were only 420 molecules which were red in color and our task is, to catch with our faucet those 420 red molecules and put it in the beaker, okay? Like if anyone assigned you that process, okay, like uh, I'm sure you would not volunteer for that, right? Because uh, that's a very difficult experiment, right? Because the million molecules are going and I have to go and grab that, you know, in my beaker, I have to grab that 420 red molecules out of all the blue molecules, okay? So what that means is, and tropically it is very, inefficient process, right? It is a very challenging process, okay? So if you wanted to recover CO2 from the atmosphere, that would be a very, very challenging process, but exactly that's what Mother Nature did, right? All those air molecules, which impinged on the leaves, right? It grabbed those CO2, okay? So it is doing exactly what I just described to you. It grabbed it and it converted it to the hydrocarbon and it is giving us those molecules, right? So we better make use of it rather than releasing it back to the atmosphere, okay? So that's, that's how I want you to think about that. All right, okay, so, so that much, now let's come back to hydrogen and electricity. Okay, so so how so we talked about this fuel, but how do we make hydrogen and electricity? And I'm going to focus on electricity because that's what my group does. We do a lot of research on making solar cells. So what we my group does is it focuses on the low cost processes for making solar solar cells for the large scale applications. And so we fabricate in my lab like inorganic solar cells, and so we try to do it just like you can print your newspaper, right? So we want to do it like a roll to roll printing. So, so, the, so the picture which, which we have in my group is, is to come up with a process, develop inks, which can be printed okay, on a flexible substrate. Okay. And so what is a solar cell? Okay. So I take it, Elijah, that most of us are chemical engineers and is doing that. Okay. And, uh, since, uh, and if that is true, then 
most likely most of you do not know what a solar cell it looks like because we don't teach in our in our classes but nevertheless okay like uh, going forward we have to learn all that like you know we as the economy moves okay and we make transition and the solar cell is basically a semiconducting device it is an optoelectronic device it has many layers my goal of showing you this is just to demonstrate to you that the solar cell has a lot of layers so what you see at the bottom is a glass on which in my group, for example, we deposit a molybdenum layer, it's a metal layer. Metal is a conductive layer. Then on that, we deposit a semiconductor layer. Okay, and this thickness from here to here is very thin. It is more like two micrometer thick. And two, what is two micrometer thick? Two micrometer is roughly one fiftieth the thickness of your hair. Okay, so, so if you look at your hair and you see what is its thickness, and imagine this 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 layer being as as one fiftieth the thickness of your hair. Okay. So it's a very thin layer, okay? And uh, then we deposit another layer of, so this layer, let's say this is P-type material, meaning it conducts the positive charges. And then we, we, we make a N-type layer which conducts the negative charges, which is electron. And then we put a conductive, highly conductive layer, so it's a metallic contact here, and we finish the device. So you can see that is an electronic device which uses the chem chemical methods to make the inks to put these things and do the whole thing. And it requires very interdisciplinary knowledge for successful research. It needs the knowledge in physics, chemistry, electrical engineering, material science and engineering, and of course, chemical engineering. Otherwise, I would not be giving you this talk, right? So, so but the, the point is that to, to do this research and to make solar cells, we all as chemical engineers, we have to go out of our comfort zone, okay? Like normally we, we are not taught this. So uh, for example, when I came to Purdue 15 years ago, I had to teach all this to myself, okay? So I took, I took, I took courses in electrical engineering. Okay, I went and I attended attended the ECE 605, and then I went to the physics department and I attended the solid state physics there course. Okay, 505, and so we have to learn all that. Okay, so we have to basically, and and it's no different than anything we learn in our own chemical engineering. Okay, all right. So the goal is in my in my lab. What we are doing is we have a printer, a slot die printer. We coat, we make the ink. Okay, we put the ink here. We coat it on a, on a, this is flexible glass. It is rolling along. You, you coat it, then you selenize it. You get your absorber layer. You put the next layer through a, 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 a water bath deposition. Then you put another layer of the zinc oxide. Then you do a deposition of the conductive layer. And then you print and you finish the device, okay? And here's a device from the lab, okay? So we have prepared, prepared a copper indium gallium sulfur selenide solar cell. It is all solution process solar cell. And as you can see, we have been able to produce a 15% efficient device. Obviously, we are trying to climb to 20%. And if you remember what 15% means is that if you take it outside, put it in sunlight, it will recover 15% of energy from the sunlight which is falling on it as a electricity. Okay. So, so this is an exciting thing which we can do as a as a as a chemical engineer. Okay, because the future does belong to electrification. Okay, I think the chemical engineering is going forward will be very much dependent on electricity, just like we use electricity in our house to light. Similarly, we'll be using electricity to produce chemicals. Okay. So it's going to change. It's fundamentally going to change how we how we how we do chemical engineering. Okay. So the third point I wanted to discuss with you is that uh, how I I told you earlier that we need land to harvest the solar energy. And however if you where whichever city you live, okay, if you go outside those cities, what do you see? Do you see empty land? Maybe in winter you see an empty line, but if you go in the summer in America, the moment you drive out of your, your city, what do you say? I'm going to let you guys think, what, what is your mental picture of the line? Okay, so like if you live in West Lafayette, all of us who are at Purdue, okay, in the summer, when we go on Route 65, what do we see around? Do we see empty lines or do we see line occupied by something? We okay. see a land occupied by corn. What yeah. Else? Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, a corn or, or soybean and everything. So do you think we should put TV panels there? Absolutely not. I need my food first, right? I need electricity later. Okay, as my priority is very straight. I don't want to, to give up the food at the cost of the electricity, right? So what I'm saying is that if you if you want the land around the city where you need the electricity, you are in trouble. Okay, because uh, there's no local land, no local empty land waiting for us. Okay, so and we need a large land area to harness solar energy. Okay, so what should we do? So what's the third part, part of the research we are doing at Purdue is how to use agriculture land for the electricity production. And I call it eclectic farming. Okay, so a lot of you have seen PV farms on the agriculture land, right? 
So when you drive on the 65, for example, from West Lafayette to Chicago, or you see like going south, like you see all the PV, you know, windmills being installed on the on the tanks. But uh, but we don't do that with the PV panels. The reason why don't we do that with PV panels? The reason we don't do with the PV panels is they cast shadow. So if you put a PV panel, it they will cast a shadow, and and the plants don't grow in shadow. Okay. So, so we need to do research. We need to find the right system, and that's exactly what we're doing at Cordy. Okay, so we started this research three years ago, and the last two summers we installed these PV panels, as you can see here. Okay, we here we are putting the seed for the corn. We grew the corn and we studied it. So we have grown two growing seasons. And what what is the goal? Our, our goal is to design these PV panels. Okay, and not only design it, learn it how to install it. Okay, and how to operate it so that the plants. Are not deprived of the solar photons when they need it. So, for example, like when the plants grow, okay, they need different quantities of energy at different times of growth. For example, during seedling, seedling, then they grow, then the flowers come out, then they grow the corn kernels, okay, then they grow the soybeans and so forth and so forth. Okay, so we are doing a very detailed study. So, for example, last summer we collected individual data on 1,700 plants. So my graduate students went out. And they spent days and days and days, weeks after weeks after weeks, collecting data on when did the seedlings came out. Okay, what is the light intensity falling on a on a given plant? Okay, throughout the day. So we have we are measuring the intensity of the light. We are correlating this with the PV panels movement. So PV panels move east to west. Okay, and then we are collecting the how the heights of the plants changed. Okay, between the ones which are in the PV panel shadows and ones which we are which are not in the PV panel shadows. When did the flowers come out? How did the corn kernels grew? What is the yield of the corn kernels from, from each of the year, corn years? Okay, so we have been collecting data on 1700 plants. And since we have all the extensive data, now we are building models of the plant growth model. So we'll put all this information in the plant growth model and, and then we'll play with the light and we'll monitor and we'll design and operate these things so that we do not sacrifice the corn yield. Okay. So that is our goal, okay? And I call it the PV electric farming. And this is a very interdisciplinary research because obviously, like, you know, I'm not an expert, agricultural expert, so I don't know how to grow. So you need the people who are agri agronomists, right? Who are expert in the agriculture. So you invite those people to join you, okay? And uh, you form water experts, you need soil experts, you need plant experts, and then people like me, like who are solar experts, you know, learning how to write the solar models, okay, modifies, and the electrical engineers are involved, okay? And so forth and so forth. Okay. So I just wanted to give you a feel at Purdue. We are one of the very unique universities in the world, okay, where we are doing this. We are putting food, energy, and water all together. And, and we are trying to create the system for a what I call for a for so for their existence. Okay. And so ultimately the picture is this on a farmland, you have the you have the PV panels, you have the windmills, you produce the electricity locally, okay, and you use the use use the local electricity. You purify the water and use in the municipal wastewater treatment. You produce the hydrogen, you produce the chemicals locally, locally. So everything will be locally and you produce chemicals on a distributed scale. So the new chemical plants, what would they be? If rather than making it 500,000 barrels a day versus if you're doing only 100 barrels a day, how will that plant look like? All the paradigm shifts, right? Because you cannot do a lot of things which you do for the large plants and so forth. So these are exciting times okay in nutshell i think we as a chemical engineers are moving in an era which is truly exciting so what are the challenges so finish my talk okay so what are the challenges as i see where i said okay so the first challenge i see is when i got into this field is understanding the big picture okay so for example what do i mean by understanding the big picture what i meant is for example people when i came when i started this research 15 years ago people are using biomass for example right to make electricity now, why would you make, use biomass to make electricity, right? Think about it. We just talked about it. It's a very low efficient, right? There's 1% efficiency. And when you convert to electricity, then again, you sacrifice 40, 50% efficiency. Whereas you can install a TV panel and you can get 20% efficiency. So why would you why would you go with a efficiency, which is, you know, 20 times and 40 times the land area, right? So, so, and, and so we need to worry about it, right? So, and not only if you start using corn and things like that for, for energy, then who is who will feed us right who is going to feed us the food okay so there's a lot of constraints so we need to understand the big picture so we we 
and identify and avoiding the suboptimal solution. So we don't want to make solutions which will hurt something else. Like for example, if you go blindly and start putting PV panels on the agriculture line, which is what some people are doing, then we again lose the food, okay? And as I said, we don't want to lose food. So we have to be patient. We have to understand all the interactions and we need to go really the right way to come up with the answer, okay? All right, okay. And avoiding the, sorry, like guys, this is the bogus call, so I need to, need to I need to shut it off. Okay, sorry. Okay. All right. So avoiding unintended negative interaction between the subsystems. So sometimes you don't want to do things which hurt the other system. So, so for example, the picture I presented to you. So you produce electricity, but then you want to use electricity for the car or for the house, or you want to make hydrogen. What will how will you store the hydrogen? Should you store energy as ammonia or as methanol? Then you use in the night because sun is not there 24 hours. So how do you store the energy? Then there's not enough batteries and so forth. So you have to understand all the interactions, okay? And of course, we need to find synergistic solutions, which is what makes it very interesting, right? So you want the solutions like the one I described to you. How do you grow food? How do you make chemicals? How do you make electricity from the same land? How do you do it? So, okay, so you look for the synergistic solutions and you must think differently, okay? So we need to take a very big picture, then we need to think differently, and then we need to dive down in all the fundamentals which we have been taught, which is what our teachers taught us, which is what we have learned, okay? And then we have to sharpen our pencil, and write down those mass transfer equations, write down all those thermodynamic laws and see what is valid. Okay, how do we go out and design it? Okay. And the opportunity is obviously great because it increases the dimension of the chemical engineering. We get to do new things. Okay, we we get to picture a new world. Okay, we need to we get to discover. Okay, we use local photons for local needs. So rather than using a central refinery, moving moving crude from Middle East all the way to, to the shores of Texas and then then using it in a big refinery, we get to use the photons in West Lafayette. So now energy is available in, 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 in West Lafayette itself. So how do we do all the local things ourselves? Like how do we use that solar photons to, to make our own chemicals, to make our own electricity, to have a whole slew and then have these distributed systems throughout the state, throughout the counties, throughout the country, connected together, okay? So as against, making one thing at a central location and sending it out. Now we make things locally everywhere and we share and how do we distribute? How do we... So a new picture begins to emerge, okay? All right, so new chemistry, of course, new materials, processes, applications, and so forth. And above all, we learn new skills. Okay, so, so I find it very exciting because as I told you earlier, I'm still learning, I'm still reading books, I'm still going in and sitting into electrical engineering classes and physics and so forth. So you're always learning, you're always a student, okay? You never, never graduate, okay? And, and so, yeah, you do graduate, you do get a degree, but what I mean is in, in some sense, you're always a perfect, a, a, a perpetual student because you're constantly learning new skills. And, and then you get to make a big, huge impact, right? You come up with things, you, you happen, and you impact how the human race is going to live, okay? All right? And it is a one big solar economy, the way I said, it is a big jigsaw puzzle as far as I'm concerned. I see it as, a, as it has many pieces which we need to, need to wrap up as a chemical engineer. We need to use the new raw material. We need to make new chemicals maybe. We need to make hydrogen. We need to store them. We need new, new biorefineries maybe. New processes, new energy storages and so forth and so forth. However, this all makes it a great time to be a chemical engineer. Okay? I think this is the best time. So when I look at you folks, I feel envious a little bit because when I was your age, it was not that good a time for me. Chemical engineering was entering an era which was called mature, almost dead. Okay, we were doing the same thing, same thing, same thing, same thing. Okay, but I think going forward, I think the next 20, 30 years are going to be absolutely what I call exciting. New things to be done, new frontiers to be explored, okay, and new chemicals to be made and so forth. It basically impact the human race forever. Okay, and with that, thank you. This is from the solar farm at Purdue's Agriculture, our electric farming, a sunrise at the solar farm, okay, and our electric farm at Purdue. And with that, uh, the floor is yours, okay? Uh, I'm done. All righty, thank you for that presentation. Uh, we'll be answering a couple questions shared in the chat uh, in the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes or so. So our first question is, can you elaborate on the costs of solar energy? Ah, okay. So the cost of solar energy is constantly coming down. So when I started research 15 years ago, just to give you an idea, it used to cost like uh, to make a solar cell, it used to cost more than $3 a kilowatt. 
Okay, so if you're making a solar module, it used to cost three dollars a peak watt. Today, it costs more like 20, 30 cents a, a peak watt. And if you go back in 1975 or so, it used to cost for when we were talking about for the space, the solar cell used to cost $75 a peak watt. Okay, so from $75 a peak watt to roughly $3 a peak watt in 2005, 2006, and today it's only 30 cents a peak watt. Okay, so the solar cell cost is coming down. As a matter of fact, last year was the last, last year, 2018 was the first year when a new solar utility scale solar plant would produce electricity at the same cost as a new natural gas power plant in the United States, not in the, where, the, where the natural gas is low cost. So if you go to the uh, so many other countries that the natural gas, which, are, which don't have the shale gas, don't have as many gases, there certainly the T would be lower cost than the natural gas, okay, to make electricity. The only Achilles heel with the solar energy is the storage. Okay, so so even though it now it, it is at the parity with the natural gas to make the make the electricity in, in our country, the challenge is obviously natural gas you can run around the clock, okay, but what do you do with the with the storage? All righty. Uh, our next question is, what are some possible changes that should be made uh, to the roll-to-roll -roll solar panels to achieve the 20% efficiency goal? Uh, I, the list is quite rather rather daunting, okay? So <laughs> obviously, like, that's my research, right? So I, I live with that. I, I think what it is is that um, the problem is that when you do roll-to-roll, -roll, the grains which grow right now, like, you know, they're not as defect free okay as the as the grains that will grow when they grow under ultra high vacuums okay and at, at very del you know very carefully controlled temperatures and pressure okay so i think uh, and that's what we're learning so basically what that means is manipulating the ink and manipulating the growth process okay and uh, of the grains okay as the crystal grow within the film okay so controlling that and that's where where the holy grail is right now. And that's where my group is, is focused. So, so just to give an idea, like in the beginning, my group used to make only 2% efficient. Then it came 3, 5, 10, 11, 12, 14, 15. Now, so I, I, think, I, I think by 2021, I'm looking at now that COVID-19 is behind, we can roll up our sleeves, go back to the lab and, uh, and do more. And so I hope, I hope we'll get there. All righty. Um, our next question is in the agroelectric agri farming, uh, how much energy did you obtain from the solar panels and how much solar panels were used for producing enough energy for usage in the farm? Okay, so those, those panels like they're on an experimental scale right now. So our goal has not been to produce electricity for use on the farm as much as like, you know, our goal is to more collect scientific data right now to understand the behavior as to, and mainly how much photons can we steal from the, from the solar energy for producing electricity? And, and, and when should we steal those photons to make electricity? Because so the plants can keep getting the photons they need and when they need it during their growth process. Okay? So, so we have been focusing more on that right now. So what we have been doing is we produce electricity. So the last two years we have done experiments last two summers we have maximized the electricity production from the PV panels, okay? So the PV panels is operating at the best efficiency, okay? But then we are letting the plants hurt a little bit because, you know, there are certain areas which have a lot of shadows and we are collecting the data. But now this summer, like in 2021, this summer, we are going to change the role. Now what we're going to do is we are going to operate the PV panels because now we have a data, we understand the performance a little bit, and we are going to change the operating condition of the PV panel so that we'll produce a little bit less electricity, okay? But the, the food yield will not, be, will not decline, okay? And so that is our goal. And then we'll see what the, how much decline we need to go, okay? So that's the short answer is, so far we have not sacrificed the electricity production from the solar panel. So, so if the solar panel is, so our solar panels, for example, are, 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 uh, are listed at 300 watts, power output so they have been producing that power output okay but uh, but 
this summer fall is really producing less. Okay, but then we have a 10% decline in the food last summer, and uh, and we are going to compensate that now this summer. Okay. All righty, thank you. And then finally, what we are writing, just one second, Ryan. Finally, what we're doing is we're writing a big model of the TV panels, light and shadows, and we're writing a big model of the of the plant. And then we're going to combine both the models together, and we are going to optimize the entire enterprise for the optimal electricity production and for the optimal food production. Okay? Very interesting, very interesting. Um, our next question is, to what extent do you expect global energy production to shift say in the next 30 years? And what advancements do you see in solar energy over that time scale? So the solar energy is advancing very rapidly, okay? People are coming up like, for example, thermoscite solar cells, which can be printed, which are very high efficiency. People are coming up with the tandem solar cells. So in the next 30 years is a long time, I think you will have in PV panels, which will be like 25 to 30% efficient, okay, printed. Okay, 25 to 30% efficient. So it'll be pretty low cost. Okay, we'll see a very high efficiency solar panels and we'll be able to design solar panels of all types. Okay, semi transparent, bifacial, we can collect light from both the sides and, and so forth. Okay, the only challenge which we'll solve in the next five to 10 years, or maybe 15 years, which might take, which I think is where will be the energy storage, on-demand energy supply. So as we convert, right? So as we convert, so right now, the solar electricity is a small fraction of the total electricity, right? But imagine if you're making 50% of the electricity by solar, then where are you going to store it, right? Because uh, like day like today in West Lafayette, it's cloudy, okay? There's not as much uh, electricity being produced, okay? Then how are you going to do it? So I think that's this is this is what could ultimately determine how fast this thing goes. Okay, but I'm I'm fairly confident. Like you know, we chemical engineers are going to discover. Okay, and I, I'm part of it. I, I'm doing modeling and a lot of research on that front. We're going to learn how to store energy chemically. Okay, so like batteries do store energy, right? But the problem with batteries is that the storage energy density is low. That's the and that's the first problem. The second problem is that the batteries, batteries degrade with time. So every three, four years, five years, you need to do something, right? And, uh, and the lithium batteries, the current challenge is there's not enough lithium, okay? So there's a lot of challenges with the battery storage, even though the battery storage is very efficient, okay? Like, you know, it is 90% to charge, 90% to discharge, okay? So overall round efficiency is 80%. But, uh, but the problem is the, is the energy density and, and so forth and the time it takes to charge and so forth, okay? So compared to that, like a natural gas or a, or a hydrocarbon is always there. You, you can fill a bucket and store the bucket, right? And then use it out of the bucket. So, so, we, so we chemical engineers have to learn how to, how to store those solar energy and, um, and you can store energy as hydrogen, for example. So in the daytime, you can use electricity to make hydrogen and in the nighttime, you can use hydrogen in the fuel cells to make electricity, okay? So, and you can use compressed hydrogen to restore it. Or in the daytime, you can convert hydrogen with the reactive carbon dioxide, make methane or make methanol, molecules like that, which you can store in the bucket. And in the nighttime, convert that to give you electricity back and produce carbon dioxide, which can store it. So there's a lot of ways of doing it. And people are doing research. So, so I'm pretty bullish. I, I think, um, so, as, so on the harnessing side, so in, in sh the short answer is, on the harnessing side of solar energy to make electricity, no problems. The advancements are great, things are happening. Okay, the, the slow step is, is, is still the, the storage. All righty, and we've got about uh, four minutes left, so we might have time for a couple more questions, uh, maybe one. Uh, but so our next question is, is there a specific reason some countries as regions have, had, uh, have been more or less successful with implementing solar technology for their energy needs? Uh, you mentioned land availability, but are there some other more important factors that could contribute to that as well? Uh, so, so again, it is the same thing, right? Like uh, how, how they, a lot of policies, local policies play a big role, okay? Like uh, local availability plays a big role. So if you see countries like uh, Japan, Germany and all, like they have a lot of uses because the local policies are quite favorable, okay, for the, for the solar energy. 
And uh, even in United States, you can see certain states where the policies are very severe, like California, for example. California wants to transition from fossil, right? California wants 30% of its energy by 2025 to come from renewable. So things are changed. So it depends on the policy, right? On the other hand, if you live in a state which doesn't care, right? And uh, then uh, business as usual is easy, right? You know, use of fossil energy certainly is very convenient. Because when you're using, as I said, like fossil energy, is you can have a one big central plant and you can, and yet you're used to using it. All the system is in place, all the infrastructure is in place. If you want to make a transition, you will have to spend money for the infrastructure. So it's not going to be cheap. Okay. And uh, so, economy is also a big role. So, a lot of countries, like poor countries, don't have money, right, to set up the infrastructure. So, they, so they can make those transitions that easily. But uh, but on the other hand, like the rich countries like America, so our country, like, you know, it's uh, certainly possible, but there is a policy issue. Okay. So. All righty. And then in our last two minutes, we have uh, one last question. Uh, what were some of the problems and bad consequences that the farm had with the implementation of the solar panels? Uh, for example, was crop production reduced or so on and so forth? Yeah, so certainly that is true. Okay, so there are a couple of challenges, right? So first challenge is how should you be installing these things, right? Because the combined harvest of those big machines, they have to still go through the to the farm, right? They, they are the ones who plant the seeds. They are the ones who who come and collect the kernel from the corn. They are the ones who put the herbicides, you know, and, and the meat things. So obviously, you can't just simply go ahead and uh, and install these things, okay? So 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 they should not like you know impede the movement of the thing. So that's the first constraint. And the second constraint is, is the PV panels themselves. They cast shadows, right? So obviously if they're collecting solar photons, so the underneath it, there's no light which is falling. And since there's no light which is falling, poor plants, they can't do their photosynthesis activity. Okay? And if they can't do their photosynthesis activity, guess what? They are not doing what they're supposed to do, grow, produce corn, okay, or produce soybean, okay? So, so that's not a good news. So, so we need to, so as a result, what we have seen our, on our own plant, the, 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 the plant rows which are under a lot of shadows, okay? We have lost like something like 10 to 15% of the yield, okay? And, uh, but on an average, the total yield loss we have seen on the, on the picture which you are seeing right now on my shared screen, okay, maybe I should stop sharing, okay? Is, uh, is, is of the order of, uh, I would say, like 10% overall. Okay, so we have seen a decline of, uh, you know, roughly 10%. Uh, and, but our goal is that in, in two, three years, being able to tell the world how to do it, so there's no decline, 